Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to the show. And I am so thrilled to have an esteemed guest with us. This is the great Professor Joshua Rifkin. He is a great performer, conductor, and scholar. And he's here today to talk about uh, his, his career, essentially, and to give a lot of wisdom and experience and the, the, the things that he's really worked on over his career that I think will be very insightful and illuminating for, for my audience. So, Professor Rifkin, welcome to the show. Well, many, many thanks. Do please call me Joshua. Professor has always seemed to me to describe <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, Joshua, why don't we talk a little bit about your background? So for my audience, um, you're, you're well known for many things, actually, because you've really done so many things in your career. But why don't you give the audience um, a brief exposition on on your, on your on you and and we will actually dive. We'll we'll go chronologically. I'd love to talk about your early training, but sure. give a little background on your on yourself. Thank you. Well, I grew up in New York City, and I had the good luck to grow up there in a very rich musical time. And then I had well, I was you know as, as usually happens, kind of like from a very 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 early age. Uh, possessed by music. I just wanted to eat music, shall we say. <laughs> and one thing, you know, I had the usual lessons and training and this and that. And th one thing sort of led to another. And particularly as I look back, seeing the rich time in which I was growing up, uh, that kind of presented a whole bunch of possibilities before me and actually invited me into some of them. So as we'll no doubt find out in more detail, um, many of the things I have done simply happened. And there <laughs> I was and was able to grab hold of it. Right, right. And how old were you when you first picked up the piano or whatever instrument you started with? It was the piano, and I imagine I must have been three or four. I okay. heard recordings of classical music that uh, my parents played, and of course I went to the piano and tried to play back what I was hearing. Um, I'm told that I could sing and carry a tune, or I was told, uh, you know, I was two or three. I mean, the, the usual prodigy <laughs> stuff, you know. Um, right. I suppose what was different in my case is that I... Uh, did I had no ambitions whatever to be a pianist per se. Um, I was much more interested in composing and in new music from really a very early age and also in conducting. So they were the principal focuses uh, with which, let's say, I began, in which I began to pursue. But I did, of course, study the piano, and I suppose that came in useful later. Right, and you went to the prestigious Juilliard school and you had many uh, you had some famous professors and you worked yep. with some famous people um can you just briefly talk about the training you received in juilliard and what was memorable for you <laughs> well i know this is a terrible thing to say but um juilliard in those days was despite its outward record really not a terribly distinguished institution, at least in the concerns that I had. Um, I was, I came there as a composition student when I was 16 years old, and um, I was already very involved with new music and really uh, what was then pretty advanced high modernism. I was mm. um, uh, composing sort of total serialism and all of this kind of thing. And I got to Juilliard and it was uh, definitely not a place that was au courant with any of these things. I can still remember that when there was a reception for the new students William Schumann, then the president of the school, met us and asked us what we did. And when he asked me what I did, and I said, oh, I'm a composer. And he said, well, what are you interested? And I said, serial music. And he said, well, we'll try to broaden your horizons here. I regret <laughs> to say that I did not have the presence of mind uh, to say, I hope not. But in any event, uh, it, 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 it was 
not, I'll have to say, a really stimulating musical environment, except for a few colleagues and one teacher to whom we'll no doubt come. Mm. But uh, for me, I am unable to say that Juilliard was a wonderful, enriching experience. Well, I've had just... others, but we'll get to them. Well, could yeah. I could I just touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Is that because it was too conservative or it was too traditional in the sense that it was not keeping up with current musical trends of that period? Those are very good questions. I'd say that it was well, that that both are true, <clears throat> but I should clarify to say that although it was conservative, it wasn't conservative certainly in a way that I found very interesting. There, there, there's more than one way to be conservative. And although I suppose I incline to radicalism uh, at the time, <laughs> in some ways still always have, uh, there are a lot of conservatives for whom I had a lot of regard, certainly in the musical field. But uh, Juilliard was more, let's say, rather than conservative, complacent. And it was not only not... Uh, aware of or alert to many recent developments, but it really was not interested in them at all. Mm. Right, right. And we, we this is a very fascinating thing. So mm. um, maybe we should talk about one name that really, because I, I bought his book, uh, which is the, yeah. uh, the great uh, pedagogue. And also I just anecdotes I've read about him were that he was a really total musician. I, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said that, and I'm talking of course of, Vincent Persichetti, as I remember an anecdote, somebody said that he would read music like a newspaper, <laughs> which I found really interesting. What? But so you you worked, you studied with him. Is is that yes, correct? I studied with him. Uh, I could almost say that I was assigned to him as my composition teacher, probably because nobody else would have me. Uh, in some ways, it's more <laughs> that he let me into the place. But um, Persichetti is one of two people at Juilliard, I'll come to the other, to whom, uh, at least on the faculty, to whom I really owe an immense amount. Um, he was a superb musician, as you say. He was a, was a fabulously good pianist. Um, he gave the premieres of many notable compositions, including, for example, Dalla Piccola's Quaderno Musicale di Anna Libera, one of the great 12-tone piano pieces of the post-war era. He was open-minded. He was, um, well, in New York terms, I'll have to say he was an utter mensch. He was <laughs> responsive. He was friendly. He was supportive. And God only knows I needed someone on my side at Juilliard. Um, he was very candid in saying that he didn't really understand what I was doing, at least from the inside. But he did say always he liked the way my music sounded. He felt I knew what I was doing, and therefore he would give me free reign to pursue to pursue what I felt I needed to pursue. So, as I say, my debt to Persichetti is enormous. And let me, before even further questions, mention one more person who you might yes. not have thought to uh, bring up here. And okay. that was a gentleman named Norman Lloyd. Uh, Norman Lloyd, I think, taught in the theory department. He is not a celebrated figure now, but he was someone who had, imagine, in the early 30s, ridden the rails to some extent, played as a uh, movie accompanist to silent films and, and the like, had a wonderfully varied background, uh, there he is, was an excellent musician. And again, um, someone who really fostered me, you could say, supported me. And again, uh, it's to him and to Persichetti, as well as to a few of my student colleagues that I really owe a great debt and that made the experience at all worthwhile. Can I ask a question about that period and the, I guess, uh, this is an overused word, but zeitgeist, um, yes. but yes. kind of, I get the sense that there was a drive for a new sound, there was a drive for some exploration, something post-tonal, and, and mm -hmm. there's a bit of a resurgence of traditionalism in recent years, but I wanted to ask you, what was the sense of of the spirit of the time was there a feeling like we need something new because maybe we're just there's too much 
late romanticism. We're <laughs> bored of it. We're sick of it. And yep. also, I'm curious, uh, as a young, precocious child, were you... Did you listen to plenty of music and realize I need something new that's separate from all of this in the 70s or the 60s? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, again, very good questions. Let's see. I think the sense that one needed something new was already a generation before mine, the post war generation in Europe. Uh, meanwhile, we've had a lot of study and documentation on this really felt that things had just reached a terminal point. Um, this is with a war right behind them, very understandable. And they had, in a sense, just to start from square one again. So you have this growth of a new kind of music uh, represented in Italy by Luigi Nono and Bruno Maderna, who were much more important pioneers than was originally recognized Stockhausen in Germany, Boulez in France, Karl Huifert in Huifert, sorry, in Belgium, people who were very consciously seeking something that hadn't been there before. So this is starting in the late 40s. I'm coming into it in the mid-50s, let's say, where I'm mm. you know, an early teenager. I'm born in 1944, so we're talking about, I guess, the mid-late 50s. Um, but I got wind of some of these things because I was writing music and interested in what was out there. So I started, as so many did, with, with Hindemith, let's say, and, and, and uh, neoclassical strings, again, Russian period, Stravinsky, and so forth. But uh, I, I got wind that there was this other stuff there. And I read about it, and I began getting scores of it and trying to listen to recordings. And it was terribly exciting. Um, one thing that people don't, I think, now understand about this period, the, the high modernist serial, serial period, mm. is that it was almost like it, it was something very thrilling, very exciting. You could almost, mm. I suppose, if you were negatively inclined, call it something of a cult. Because the <laughs> element of faith, we did believe in this in so many ways. Um, but I was certainly taken up by it, uh, very, very, very enthused by it. I remember getting into disputes with my composer colleagues, my student colleagues at Juilliard, for example. Um, oh, you know, they included, by the way, slightly older than myself, Philip Glass and Steve Reich. Mm. And, you know, when somebody did something that seemed atonal, saying, well, but, you know, is it is it serial? Are you controlling it in those ways? And mm. if they said no, I said, well, you know, you're not doing it right, etc. I must have been pretty insufferable in those ways. But <laughs> in any event, it, 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 it is something that almost took possession of one. And so uh, after my first year in Juilliard, in fact, I went during the summer over to Darmstadt, uh, which was the sort of center of the European avant-garde, the so-called international vacation courses for new music, where I'd been admitted into Stockhausen's composition seminar, etc. So I was now absorbing it at the source. Um, was that 94? Yes, Stockhausen oh, bit... was, 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 was considerably younger when I saw him. <laughs> um, and he also, by the way, this gets ahead of things a bit, was an enormously compelling figure, I'll have to say. I, I'm, not, I'm hardly the only one who saw him that way, who responded to him that way. Uh, that's more, yes, that's more like it. I was there in 61 for the first time. So it was just... And an exciting period, so much was happening. And a lot of it was happening or reflected in New York City. Stravinsky mm. came to conduct there every year. Um, you had other advanced composers, not the Europeans, but in a very different way, but still advanced. There was Milton Babbitt, there was Stefan Volpe, there was Edgar Varese, whom I came to know when I was a teenager, etc. So um it was just incredibly lucky, you know, to to be there. It was wonderfully exciting. Um, I lost the faith eventually, um, although I never felt that, you know, I was a sort of dupe or anything like that. Uh, I think one evolved, but that's where I, that's where I began. You can say. Well, uh, I want to ask you. Um, I just want to stay on this a little bit because. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was just trying to look for I, I like 
um, I was thinking of the Russian Five, and I, I remember in a, in in, <laughs> in a, some sense they had a very strong identity, and they were pushing for something as well. And I was very tickled also by the way they described contemporary composers, such uh-huh. in the way that. Mozart, uh, Bach was seemed petrified, or <laughs> Chopin was a nervous society lady. They liked, <laughs> they liked um, um, Berlioz. They liked this person. They didn't like that person. Right. So, yeah. at, at in that period, then in the fifties and the sixties, yeah. what was if somebody played Mozart or Bach or mm-hmm. Chopin in your circle? How would that have gone down? Oh, well, it would have gone down very well, actually, because, okay. you know, being devoted to the newest music did not mean that one rejected earlier music. In fact, I, mm. and I think most of my friends certainly were just, again, um, omnivorous for this. We were trying to get it all. So um, we tried to know all of Mozart, all of Bach, all of Beethoven, all of these people, um, I mentioned going to Darmstadt when I was 17, but at the same time in Darmstadt, I took out subscriptions to the new complete editions of Bach and Mozart, the Neue Bach Ausgabe, mm. the Neue Mozart Ausgabe. We all saw no contradiction there. Um, we felt um, even the European composers who were trying to start from square one also felt in many ways part of inheritors to the tradition. Mm. The people who were not interesting were the people who just did not, in a sense, were complacent, as, as, mm. as, as, as I said before. So tonal music seemed, you know, impossibly the wrong thing. Um, after all, even then, it was more than 50 years since the birth of atonality in, you know, in mm. Vienna. That, that, that music was still new, still exciting. It shouldn't have been new still, but it's showing in a way how <laughs> retrograde everything else was, that it was considered yeah. still new. And of course, in some ways, uh, it's a more complicated thing. In some ways, it's never lost its newness, and in some ways, it remained new because people just couldn't quite get with it. But still, I'll say whatever you know, revisionism I, I may have come into in later years, um, it is the most, it is the powerful music. It is the music that still to me is the most exciting of the 20th century. Uh, mm. I mean, from that, from that time onward and in that tradition. Uh, there were exceptions, of course. I mean, Stravinsky was always, uh, Babbitt was very important, let's say, in-, in And you in, studied with Milton Babbitt. I studied not comp- though not composition. When later I okay. went as a graduate student to Princeton, I took his theory classes, and it's true I spent more time in Milton's classes than I did in official musicology classes. Um, and Babbitt was also one of these very, very magnetic, charismatic, charismatic characters. I didn't love the music, but um, although I came to admire some of it, that was. Uh, but that's another story. But um, yeah, he always certainly was very, very, very clear that, uh, you know, it's not advanced versus conservative. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he always, you know, all, always, uh, let's say, supported Stravinsky and, you know, but uh, it, it, it was, it, it still boiled down in many ways to quality. I mean, among conservative composers, I always at least of almost always, um, really loved Copland. I thought the music was wonderful and beautifully done. And so it didn't matter, you know, if it, it, if, if it was all, quote, tonal, unquote. Um, <laughs> the Kid is a great piece and, and always was. So uh, I don't think any of us were closed off in those ways. There were some people, of course, who were so in the avant-garde that they didn't really devote much time to the older music. But I know even colleagues in the John Cage circle and the world of Fluxus, et cetera, where I also mm-hmm. was, um, if you talked about this music to them or if you raised it, you discovered they knew it. They had grown up mm-hmm. with it. They valued it. Uh, it's just not, it just wasn't their chief concern at the moment. Right. And I just had this is such a fascinating area. And just maybe one the final question, which is, did you ever read accompanying philosophy uh, in that period? Because did, were, were people trying to seek some kind of transcendence 
through this? Were they trying to, if I pursue this path, something will happen. I will, I will <laughs> perhaps find a, a level of understanding of reality that perhaps will go to the next level. Um, as far as I can recall, I didn't. Um, I may have been too siloed in on music. I mean, uh, I did have other interests. Maybe I was influenced as much by cinema at the time, um, by politics, um, and other such stuff. Philosophy, I didn't really read, or I don't recall reading that kind of thing that had an important effect on me. I think it really came through the music and was really focused on it always one way or another. So what happened and then after that period in your career? Yes. Well, a number of things happened. Let's see. Uh, first of all, I had a parallel, I had a parallel existence or even parallel existence, <laughs> say, one might say, to the focus on writing this, 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 this extremely abstruse new music that I'm sure nobody particularly wanted to hear. Um, for one thing, as I say, there was the connection to older music. I, I, I loved the standard repertory and I wanted to be engaged in it. I wanted to be performing it, uh, particularly conducting it. And I also, from very early on, loved early music. I mean, so pre-Bach and, 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 and Renaissance music and earlier Baroque music, I was very lucky that, for example, my, my, my piano teacher, one of the other people to whom I owed a lot, a now forgotten mm. but really excellent musician named David Leibovitz, uh, was also a choral conductor and introduced me to Bach cantatas and to Schutz. Um, and so that helped bring me into that part of the world. And um, through another series of connections, I had become acquainted with early jazz and started playing it and then became what was known in the day as a folky. And I played the <laughs> down in Washington Square in New York City from the age of 13, 14. Um, so those things went on. And as it happens, they helped, they, they, they actually contributed to the changes that took place subsequently in, in, in a number of ways. Um, first of all, I got interested in music history. The early music interested me. And when I was about 16, I think, I learned some still just between high school and Juilliard. I learned that uh, something earth-shaking had taken place in mm -hmm. work on Bach that um, his works, most of which were, he had not dated. Um, and you know, dating is something that's once interested in, you know, when did mm. so-and-so write this, what led to what, etc. It's a kind of old fashioned concern, but I think a, still a sensible one. Um, the entire uh, scaffolding, you might say, of Bach's, of Bach chronology had been radically overturned in the late 1950s, really in the years 1957. Oh, okay. And I was stunned to read about this. And also, so I wanted to learn more. And then I started to learn more about brief, what was done. Briefly, what, what was overturned? So what was initially thought? And then what was the new revelation? Okay. Um, well, the greatest bulk of Bach's output is the vocal music, uh, the cantatas, the oratorios, the passions, etc. And most of them didn't have a dating. Now, in the 19th century, a very brilliant scholar named Philip Spitta uh, was really perhaps the greatest Bach scholar. It's certainly a very, 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 very great scholar. Um, wrote what had long been the definitive biography of Bach, mm. a volume publication, came out in what, 1873 and 1880, I think. Um, and he, one of the things he grappled with was this problem of, okay, when did Bach write the music? And he came up with a brilliant tool for sort of figuring this out in the vocal works. Uh, he had an insight that really was uh, pretty revolutionary, that you could um, identify papers through their watermarks. Um, 
And you could, for example, see that, let's say, this whole bunch of Bach cantatas, if we had the original scores, the original parts, ah, there he is, um, you could say, well, these all had the same watermark in them. That is, they must have been done on the same batches of paper or same batch of paper. And thus, they must be chronologically contiguous or all, all but surely chronologically contiguous. And Spitta, um use this insight to erect this wonderful chronology of particularly the cantatas. And it was so brilliant, and he was so brilliant, that uh, nobody dared question <laughs> it. Or when anybody had the temerity to do so, it always turned out that they hadn't thought through the matter well enough, and Spitzer really was right about it all. However, <laughs> uh, for various reasons, the early 50s, um, people started to go at this again. And in particular, two scholars in Germany by the name of Alfred Dürer and Georg von Dadelsen really sort of like went absolutely, you know, right down to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. And they had Spitz's tool of paper, but they were able to use it in a more sophisticated fashion. And they had something that he hadn't really used, and that was handwriting. They could trace mm -hmm. the development of Bach's handwriting and Bach all through his life relied on copyists, usually pupils, to, let's say, create parts of his pieces and, you know, help him in all of this stuff. And uh, Dürer and Donalds in particular sort of started to sort out all of these people who worked for him. Um, and it turned out that Spitta had also made some very elemental mistakes and also had been in some ways prejudiced and had kind of put his thumb on the scale at certain points <laughs> so subtly that nobody really noticed it. I mean, Spitta, like any writer, was ideologically driven, even if he didn't know it. Um, and in particular, he had an image of Bach uh, as, a, as a Lutheran church composer, um, uh, and this was also connected to certain German national ideals. I don't mean nationalistic in the bad sense, but certainly, uh, you know, Bach as German comes into this very much. Uh, needn't go into detail, but it, it turned out later, if you looked at kind of a juncture in his chronology where the evidence was not really there, he kind of came up with a lovely, brilliant surmise that was rooted in these ideological bases. Well, now all of this was exploded. So whereas it was thought that <laughs> it composed, Bach had composed cantatas throughout his time in Leipzig, and in particular composed one great group of cantatas, the so-called chorale cantatas between 1735 and 1744, Mm. He composed virtually all his cantatas within two years of arriving at Leipzig in 1723. Wow. And the Royal cantatas were written 1724 to 1725, i.e. as much as 25, 20 years earlier than anybody had thought. And that was an earthquake in Bach studies. And I was lucky sort of to catch wind of this. And part of me was thinking, well, how did they do this? You know, I want to know more about this. And what I discovered is Because maybe who else has been chronologically misdated? Well, um, other people, not as drastically, perhaps, but Mozart, there's a lot, there was a lot wrong with Mozart as we thought about it then. Uh, a lot wrong with, with Josquin Desprez, but that's more esoteric, although that occupied quite, has occupied quite a bit of my life. Uh, Beethoven, I want to ask you about that, definitely, Josquin. That would be very interesting. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that. But uh, see, by about 1800, you know, everything is getting dated. Composers put dates on most manuscripts and mm. stuff is published. There is, but the farther back you go, the less uh, evidence you really have. But so that this could be done with Bach, and then, as I say, the way they did it, I mean, what is this paper? Handwriting, it sounded like mysteries, like secrets, you know? And of course, when you're confronted with a secret, you want to know what it is. So that got me into that, and that got me interested in, in the musicological work, the historical work. At a certain point, um, I had gone to Juilliard. I graduated when I was 20. Uh, and I faced a choice, graduate studies or get drafted. This was the Vietnam era. Mm. Well, not only did I, did I not want to get shot at and killed, but I 
really, like everyone I knew, was was vociferously against the war at the time. I, I would not go into that, you know. So uh, I didn't go to Canada. I, I went to graduate school. That's what one did in those days, basically, to avoid the draft. And um, I did not feel that there was anybody in the U.S. with whom I really wanted to study composition. So at that point, I made the decision to apply for musicology and study that. And I was accepted one or two places. And so that became the work that I was doing officially. Um, and I kept composing, but gradually, I'll have to say that fell away largely because, as I mentioned, I lost my faith in serialism, but didn't arrive at something to replace it. I can still uh, admire those colleagues of mine who did. I mean, in that way, yes, kudos to, to Philip or to Steve Philip Glass or Steve Reich uh, or to my very dear friend in that era, still Paul Lansky and others who found a way to get out of this apparent uh, cul-de-sac but not fall back on neo-romanticism or something. But I couldn't go to the places, but I couldn't go to minimalism and I couldn't go to neo-romanticism. Was there a moment, was there a, a moment in time that suddenly you had that epiphany? Um, probably not one moment, but if I look back a few moments in a fairly concentrated period, and this gets me back to this other, other part of my life that I raised. Um, one of the, the I, I suppose if the, there was an earthquake in Bach studies, the other birth, earthquake was the Beatles and 60s pop, this amazing music that came out. I mean, I still remember the first time I heard the Beatles, I had heard of them. We had read stories, heard the rumors, but when they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show in the States, and I heard this and, you know, um, and I mentioned Paul Lansky, very eminent composer now, uh, we were closest friends at the time. And right after this is done, the phone rings and it's Paul calling says, did you see that? You know, it, it, it just amazed us. Um, so wait I, a second. So uh, in, in a very high level of avant-garde composers, there is a discussion about the Beatles. The Beatles knocked us all out. Uh, and, and really? Avant-garde composer. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 60s pop in general was... Uh, you know, 60s rock, 60s uh, no longer Broadway uh, adjacent pop, but this newer pop, it, 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 it knocked us all out. And every composer, I mean, I remember speaking with members of the Cage Circle about this. Um, all of my colleagues, all of my contemporaries at Princeton when I went there uh, in 67 onwards. And the thing was, uh, and I've written about this someplace, that was very subversive. Because how could this music that was created not by all the fearsomely learned characters who were creating the music to which we were mm. devoted as modernists, um, and this music which was tonal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, have something that we recognized as, you know, you could almost say transcendent value. Uh, this, this, this just didn't fit. And it really changed uh, the lives of a lot of people one way or another. Um, there is, this is one of the secret hist to be, histories to be written, but there <laughs> is a group of highly gifted, high modernist composers who radically changed or even stopped composing. I don't know if I was a, one of the high modernists, uh, highly gifted, but I wasn't, I wasn't bad either. Uh, but I was one of those who fell by the wayside in this, uh, found it impossible really to continue where one was. So this also mm -hmm. was a crisis of faith, you could say. And this happened, I would say, yeah, within within a couple of years, you know, in, 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 in the mid to late 60s. Can I quickly just ask about Elvis? Because Elvis had a quite a similar sort of explosion, I guess, in the 50s. Elvis didn't reach me or my circle. 
um, I mean, you're right about, about the impact of Elvis, and without Elvis, there would have been no Beatles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, most of us were still still found it far, and in, in a way, almost beneath beneath our <laughs> um, I, I can remember that uh, you know I spoke of the folk music scene. Um, in 1963, again through a series of lucky accidents, I became a member of a jug band, and we. What is a jug fact, band? A jug band was a small ensemble, uh, play in, in in the mostly rural no in the in the well rural and urban south in the 20s and 30s, uh, largely African-American, largely black in origin. Um, there you can see, I think that's Gus Cannon and his Jug Stompers, uh, that played a blues and jazz inflected music, but mm. on acoustic instrument, not on the jazz instruments, but as you see, banjo, guitar, um, and uh, kazoo, um, and as a bass instrument, they often used, in fact, a jug, which was blown through um, the way one through with, with trumpet or trombone. You know? And so it was, again, through just a lucky accident that I wound up one evening doing this music. But that brought us to Electra Records, and that brought me into the record business, which also then shaped a lot of my life. Um, but at the time, in the junk band, really, we were also hardcore traditionalist folkies most of the time, which meant pop music was also not something. You know, <laughs> even look at modern you know, folk music like the Kingston Trio or Peter, right. Paul, and Mary. Now, we wanted the real old, you know, hard knuckle so stuff. That was too polished and a little bit artificial. You got it. <laughs> um, there were exceptions. John Sebastian, the, who, who went on to found the Love and Spoonful and make a great career in pop, uh, was a member of the group, and he knew rock and roll very well. But how did was, Bob Dylan fare in the circle? Well, Bob Dylan was okay as a folk. He was somewhat controversial. There were those who loved him, those who hated him. Mm. I regret to say I was one of the latter at the time, and I think for an episode. Boy, was I ever mistaken! Uh, I didn't learn to. I didn't come to love Dylan until just a bit later when he went electric. And when I heard Dylan's electric music, I was absolutely blown away. But by that time, my life had, in many ways, changed. Uh, mm. However, the relationship to pop music, and then it was the Beatles that really crystallized it. The Beatles made this music, among other things, respectable for intellectuals. Um, Intellectuals in, in, in so far, you know, literary types and all of that, um, were interested in vernacular music. It was mostly jazz. Uh, yes. but now suddenly every English professor was writing about the Beatles, you know. Um, it, 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 it suddenly, it, it changed the whole paradigm, mm. you might say. Uh, right. in so far as, by the way, uh, let's see, what used to be called high culture has been eclipsed for more demotic culture, pop culture, etc. Mm. In the halls of academe, any place you look, this is the period where that is happening, where that transition is taking place. Um, and indeed, uh, it, 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 it certainly all of us, when, those whom I knew, um, were very affected by this and could not maintain at least unquestioningly all elements of the relationship to high culture that we'd once had. Mm. Um, so which came first? Your Because uh, you, like you mentioned, you, you were introduced to the recording career and you yeah. had quite a huge effect on culture at, uh, in the 70s, an enormous effect. But then also in musicology, you had, an, you had a very... Um, uh, very significant impact because uh, I want to talk about the historical numbers of singers in a chorus because I think sure. I, if, if anyone goes to your Wikipedia page, it will say it was yeah. controversial at the beginning, but it has gained quite an, an influence in yeah. in uh, in uh, performance practice. So which came first, the the Joplin or the or the the chorus <laughs> work? <laughs> oh, very 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 fair question. Uh, let's see. Okay, just just maybe chronology is useful here. 
um, as I say, in 63. So I'm 19 years old. I'm about to graduate Juilliard. No, in fact, I still have a year left at Juilliard. Um, I come into the jug band. Uh, by the way, also, you see in that year, I took part in the first performance of Satie's Vexation, the 18-hour piano piece that John Cage <laughs> had arranged. So already I'm, I'm, I'm doing a number of kind of things that you wouldn't expect to come together. Uh, but I come into the record train, the record business, and by the mid-60s, in fact, I am doing my own recordings there. I, I've become a recording artist, uh, you might say. Um, so there is that connection. And then in, what is it, 1970, two things again happen. I leave Princeton, I take an academic job. And in the years, in a couple of years before that, I'd been introduced or reintroduced to ragtime in Scott Joplin. Um, I'd known this music some uh, since I had been maybe an adolescent or even pre-adolescent. I mentioned the early jazz connection, and there I came across some of Joplin. I played it, but of course, in a very uh, early jazzish manner with more improvisation, swung rhythms, etc., etc., etc. It was really um, another close friend of the period, uh, composer and critic Eric Salzman, now sadly no longer with us, who brought my attention to Joplin again. And with him, William Balcom, who is happily still with us. And Bill and I had come to know each other when I was a Juilliard student, and he was up in Yale, already a graduate composition student. Uh, but somehow our paths crossed, I think, through his first wife, who was at Juilliard. Uh, whatever it is, this, this nexus brought me back to Joplin, and I became utterly, uh, there they are, Bill and Joan. Uh, Joan was not the right wife at the time, but um, they're both wonderful people. Bill, whom I sadly have not seen in many years, was, was again, a very magnetic character, wonderful musician. And I became really just tremendously taken up with Joplin. And of course, there I was at a record company and I was making records for them. So I was able to come to them somewhere in roughly the spring of 1970 and say, you know, we really ought to record this music. And uh, I can I can get the pianist for you cheap, and um, you know when they agreed to do this and 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 to be very honest, uh, well I thought I said we ought to do it and we ought to do it on a classical record label and present it in a certain way, you know, uh, and this was I think very different. This is not the way Joplin or Ragtime had been known and presented, and uh, fortunately they liked the idea. They went along with it. And we put it out, I'm not exaggerating here, we put it out in the early autumn of 1970. I had just also moved from New York to uh, the Boston area, where I now became an academic. And uh, as we did with everything at Nonsuch in those days, we simply put it out on the market to die. Um, Nonsuch did Zero marketing, zero advertising. At most, you know, uh, they brought new records to people at radio stations. That was it. And to our astonishment, literally to our astonishment, um, people really started getting excited by this music. It went uh, viral, to use the modern parlance. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean... I, I expected that it would sell a few more copies than my recordings of late 15th century French secular music, you know, which I had done, you know, and which sold a few hundred copies or something like Can that. Can you remember the recording session? What was the recording session like? And how what, did you use multiple sessions? Uh, I remember it very vividly. We, of course, we used multiple sessions. We, you know, we had to do many takes of each piece. I worked with this wonderful production team uh, of an engineer named Mark Obor, A-U-B-O-R-T, and um, sort of producer, cum engineer, Joanna Nickrens, um, 
who, among other things, uh, she's now no longer with us, sadly. Uh, I, I love them both. Uh, I think Mark is gone, but I don't know. No, no, he, he, he could hardly be there. Mark J. O'Bor, Joanna Nickrens. Joanna's daughter, uh, Erica Nickrens, is a very distinguished pianist. Uh, these wonderful colleagues, uh, Tracy Stern, of course, who was the uh, head of Nonsuch at the time, and played obviously really the essential role in getting this done. We recorded in New York City uh, at a church on the Upper West Side at, at Broadway and 72nd Street, which was a beautiful acoustic, had the, uh, did have the problem that, that, that subways ran underneath it. So we would get <laughs> destroyed by subways. And these were the early days. Uh, it was still tape, but they had the Dolby noise reduction system newly introduced. And that meant that we didn't have tape hiss to cover up the subway rumble. So that was a technical challenge that we had to face. Nevertheless, we did it then. Uh, this was over the summer just before I moved up to the Boston area. Uh, Mark and Joe were these wonderful producers. And at a certain time, I remember, uh, you know, I wrote liner notes. Uh, we insisted that there be a serious looking cover, that there'd be some dignity to this. Yeah. Um, and as I say, then, then it appeared and it took us all by surprise. Well, it says here that um, it sold 100,000 copies in the first year. And went to become the first million selling album for Nonsuch. I don't think in the first year it sold a hundred thousand. If it sold a million eventually, that took quite a few years. I mean, I, I know I had the royalty statements, you know, <laughs> um, and certainly it 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 benefited my financial status. But I can tell you that the earliest royalty statements may have been in the low five figures, you know, nothing, nothing like a hundred thousand copies. In fact, I can remember that later after I left Nonsuch and was recording for Decca um, in the UK, my producer there who had been a producer in New York for a long time at CBS and whom I had gotten to know there once said to me, you know, if you'd recorded that for CBS, it would have sold a million. And I said to him at the time, yeah, but if I'd recorded that for CBS, I never would have recorded it. They wouldn't have done it. Uh, right. Really, it took not such to do it. So, uh, But yes, it did, uh, whatever the exact figures, I suppose if I went back through all my royalty statements, I could add it up, but I've, 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 I've never felt inclined to do that. Um, it, certainly, it certainly did well, and it spawned two successor albums so just really quickly before we go to the yeah. the, the number of singers in a right. chorus right. um in january of 1971 harold c schoenberg very influential oh yes. uh, figure wrote a nice article in in the new york times telling scholars yeah. get busy on scott joplin so yeah. how did you react i mean just one in one moment you're recording in a church there's the subway going you mm -hmm. think like you said you're just the record is going out to die you're not expecting much then it's selling hundreds, thousands of copies, and now influential figures. How yeah. how was the what was the mood like at that time? What were you thinking? Well, um, I knew Har I knew Harold Schomburg, by the way. He, he was an acquaintance of my father, so we had known each other since I was an early teenager. Ah. Um, I, I think um, again, it it was heady. Um, he wasn't the only one, as I say. There really was this groundswell. Record magazines were right. You know, I was being approached to do concerts, this and that. I should say, by the way, that this was also not in and of itself something new. In 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 this respect, already the Jug Band had quite a success. In 1965, when I came to the, uh, when I had already been at a record company, we did a recording of, uh, it was called a Baroque Beatles book that, that turned Beatles songs into authentic Baroque music. And that was a <laughs> bestseller. Um, then uh, right in the wake of that, I had recorded as an arranger with Judy Collins um, and we had gold record albums. And so, uh, and and I was already known for this. So it, in a way, you know, in those days, I was I was not unknown. So when the Joplin came 
you could say it was it was more of the same, just pushing it to a different level. Just as I'll get ahead slightly, uh, in 1973, when the film The Sting was made, I was just about uh, to mention that. Yes. Well, uh, just very quickly, I can say that. Um, George Roy Hill, the director of the film, in fact, asked me to do the music, um, but I, for various reasons, I I, I did not. Um, I, I I didn't I didn't it's not I I didn't accept the offer as it were, um, and as I said at the time, you know, look, we had been numbers one and two on the classical charts, etc., etc., etc. So it was already you know famous, celebrated, but this made it ridiculous. You know, it pushed it to uh, yet another level, but. It's a terrible thing to say, but I was sort of accustomed to a measure of celebrity or fame. I mean, yeah. Now maybe right, I'm right. a bit obscure, but these these were different times. That's a long time ago. So there um, you go. Just to uh, end the the the, the yeah. section on Scott Joplin, yeah. what are your top three of his compositions that are special to you? Oh dear, that's very hard. That is hard to say because I love them all, and I love most the one I'm playing at the moment. <laughs> I suppose I'd have to include. I won't say these are the top three, but off the off the you know off the bat, I could name um, Solace. Oh, Solace! Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, Magnetic Rag, and one. I don't know which I'd come up with. Let's let's say. There and just about anything else. I mean, Scott mm. Joplin is a wonderful composer. This he's a genius. Also, he is a genius, and this also, yeah. you know, had an influence on me. Um, he wrote, he wrote this really beautiful, exquisite music, um, and he is clearly a thinking musician. I mean, I, 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 I love Joplin as a man, you know, as a human being, uh, even beyond, even uh, even beyond him as a composer. It, it, it's both. You know, so uh, Joplin also, yes, he, he had a tremendous effect on my life. Now, so let's what did you make what, of his? Uh, I just, just I have no, to please. include this. What did you make of? Uh, I, I talked to a scholar, Philip Tarita from Germany, and he talked yes. about um, Scott Joplin owning a copy of Salomon Yadison's Counterpoint Treatise and was heavily annotated, apparently. So, does that uh, surprise it, you or is it, his training? It, it, it does not. Joplin studied, you know, he had some formal training, maybe not extensive, but he studied with, uh, and I haven't checked the newer literature on this, but, you know, an immigrant German music teacher mm. um, in Sedalia, where he, Missouri, uh, where he was growing up. Uh, not, not, sorry, uh, Tex Arcana. And then in Sedalia, he attended classes at a college for uh, black students and studied music there he certainly is musically literate he could he could read he um he could clearly arrange you know the choral writing in tremonitia for example up to eight voices is immensely skillful it, it doesn't just sound beautiful it's written by somebody who really knows a how to make the music sound and really knows how to engineer the notes on paper so you're dealing with a musician of indeed considerable sophistication that he would have carefully studied counterpoint. Um, Joplin is, in the best sense, an aspirational character. And he is always clearly pushing himself and learning. I mean, that's any artist is. You know, the Beatles were, um, Mozart was, Beethoven was. You're always looking for more. You're always looking to go beyond. I mean, you may not even be consciously looking, even knowing that you're doing it, but that's what you're doing, and that's what mm. Joplin did. So Joplin had an immense impact there. Um, I will mention one last thing on Joplin, and that a few years ago I was contacted by the very prestigious German music publisher, G. Henle. Uh, they're the people who mm. put out sort of the standard the vortex. Of the yes, vortex yes. of Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, these very, very sober blue covers. There, yes. um, they have asked me if I would do an edition of Scott Joplin for them. Uh, I haven't yet come to do it. I hope that I'll be able to come to do it in the next couple of years. Um, I, uh, the last I knew the project is still alive. Um, and, of course, I feel that as an obligation, and that would be a lovely way to 
I still do play the music sometime, but also to round out, in a sense, my engagement with Joplin and really give back to him uh, mm. something. And the thought of Joplin in Henley's beautiful blue color, uh, covers next to Beethoven and Schubert <laughs> and Chopin is immensely gratifying. Yes. Okay. So there you are in the 70s. At the same time, I'm... Uh, yeah, I've, I've, so you talked about chorus that that immediately put yeah. the image to mind of your very important work in this field. So it yes. was it wasn't universal. It was controversial, but again, no. it was very influential, and a lot of people are are uh, compelled by it. So what happened there? How did you come to that research? And how do you come happening? to that? Exactly. Well, that's that. Uh, yes, as I say, rounding out Joplin is the, is is indeed the pivot to that. Um, but in fact, again, I'll 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 go back just a little bit earlier. Um, already in my late teens, I was very interested in questions of performance. In fact, that's one of the main reasons also that I did musicological studies. I wanted to learn, you know, well, how do you how do you play box trills properly? What are the tempos? How do you do this? How do you do that? Because one was very soon aware that, you know, that the recipes one had, you know, for playing Beethoven or Brahms or whatever, were not necessarily all applicable here. So I was very interested in that. And quite early, I started conducting Bach. I think I did my first Bach performance as a conductor when I was 17 or 18, you know, one way or another. And I, I remember putting on cantatas in a Greenwich Village coffee shop with Juilliard <laughs> colleagues uh, when I was 18 or 19. So um, I was very interested in this. And there's a question that anybody who conducts Bach cantatas is going to face at, at, at a certain point. And put very dumbly, it's this. Um, we all know that the arias are supposed to be sung by a single voice and that the choruses are sung by a chorus. But if you actually look at Bach's music, you find that there are a lot of movements that it's not clear who is to perform them, pieces with mm. three voices. And if you look at record, if you listen to recordings at the time, you'll find one recording had this sung by a chorus and another recording had it sung by three singers. Ah. And you can, ex you can amplify these things. And of course, I wanted to know well, which really was it. You know what, what's going on here? How do you choose? And the thing is that Bach didn't say anything about it. You know, and and if you look at let's say you know later scores, Beethoven Mr. Solemnis, it says clearly what's the chorus, what's the solo singers, but nothing of this in Bach. And you know, how do you decide this? How do you do it? Okay, so that's that's one thing. This question is there with me as a very practical issue. Then there is something else that uh, happened. There was at the time in Germany, a conductor and musicologist by the name of Wilhelm Amon. Now, Amon was a man, as I did not know at the time, with a really horrible political past. This guy was an arch Nazi. I was not aware of this at the time. He was a wonderful musician at the same time, you know, one of these difficult cases that you have. And like many old Nazis, he'd managed to fetch up with a good position in post-war West Germany, hmm. where he was the director of, uh, of, of, of a church music school and conducted a choir and made recordings. And they're beautiful, by the way. You see, that's the terrible thing. And he had a theory that was, uh, as I realized, not very well based. I didn't go into all the details, but that Bach performed certain sections of his choruses or choral movements with single voices. And this interested me too. Well, how did he know? How, how could you tell? And he made recordings like this. And even he was not the only one. Um, the great American choral conductor, Robert Shaw, did a recording of the B minor mass at this time that actually had many, many sections sung by single voices, not the full chorus. And I'll have to say that when I heard this, sounded like magic to me. I mm. thought, this is wonderful. I love the That sound. is correct. <laughs> That's <laughs> the correct word. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I said, I knew that the research behind it was not really solid. That it, uh, but, but, but clearly, some part of me always wanted to figure this out. And I think I had a prejudice towards 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 single voices. What was now, the opinion at the time? Did people think that that was a crazy idea, or was that just oh, do what you want, or just we don't know, so it's up up for grabs? I think they thought that it was a possibly attractive idea, but crazy in the sense of not really well founded. I mean, 
Um, it had been examined critically by Alfred Dürer, the name that I mentioned before, who said, look, the evidence just doesn't support it. And Dürer was absolutely right. The evidence as it existed didn't support it. Now, there was, I'll get slightly ahead of the game, but perhaps it's useful to explain this conceptually. Um, as Amon understood it, you had the chorus as your point of departure, as your basic unit, and you, uh, what is the word, you subtracted from it. You reduced it to single voices. And as I eventually learned, the chorus was the single voices, and in certain circumstances, you added to it. As I commonly uh, would describe it, it's like in a pop recording, the basic track, singer and guitar, and the overdubs. Right. And the so-called chorus, which is actually inaccurate, but the lar more singers are, are an overdub. So... These, uh, I, I hadn't realized this yet, you know. I mean, I, I saw things the way everybody saw it. I, I grew up in that tradition. But in the 70s also, I was assigned um, by the New Grove Dictionary, which was being created, you know, the standard English language music dictionary. Well, I was asked by the editor, Stanley Sadie, if I would write for them and asked, um, what would you like to do for us? Um, I was lucky. Some people you know, sort of thought that I was fairly capable, and Stanley was one of them. So I said, "Well, you know, you're not going to let me write about Bach. I know that, but 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 I'd love to. Write. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to write about Schutz. I'd like to do the Schutz article, and I, I, I loved Schutz. I loved that music from very early. So um, I said, I'll, 'I'll I'll do that.' They agreed. So one of the things that I figured I had to do when I was working on this article was really uh, do the work list, and these were a very important part of Grove, and, saw, and, and, and which meant looking at just all of the sources of the music, every original printed edition, uh, every manuscript that survived, uh, which I did actually in, in, in the space of three or four years maybe. And, of course, when I was looking at them, I was also looking at them with a performer's eye because I was interested in how you perform this music. So I was, you know, keeping my eyes open for clues on performance. And this is where I got what was the most important uh, piece of information. What I discovered with Schutz was that... You have a that, that singer sang not from vocal scores as they do today, sort of like all four voice parts of a normal four voice texture with a piano reduction. They sang from individual parts, the way uh, orchestral musicians, chamber musicians still do. Mm. So if you have a clarinetist playing from a part, you had a soprano reading and singing from a part. And it was clear that. Each singer got his own copy of the music. So each soprano got one soprano part. Each tenor got one tenor part. There's really no question about it. It was very simple, black and white. In fact, today, normally, two singers sing for their own copies of the music. There had been a legend, I can really call it a legend, that with Bach, singers shared their music. They mm -hmm. read three of them reading from the same music. But so I found this with Schutz, and, I, and, and, and it was very clear, and of course the consequences were very obvious. If you have only one copy of a part, there's only one singer. So if you have four parts, let's say one soprano, one alto, one tenor, one bass, the performance is done by four singers, not a modern choir. Um, Obviously, you have to be able to show the relation to the proportion of singer to part. You have to show that you know, there weren't many parts that are now lost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Um, but if those things uh, in here, that's what you have. And at the time, of course, I remember thinking, well, that's great. I started looking around the 17th century, same with Monteverdi, same with Books Huda, blah, 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 blah. And of course, I'm thinking, yes, but when did it change? When did it become what Bach did? You know, when did you have the more people and people sharing their music that you had with Bach? Because 
I believed it. You know, that's what I was trained to believe. And I still remember that on one afternoon in 1978, see, I really can still remember, <laughs> I'm sitting in the Harvard Music Library, uh, which had a special collection of microfilms, a huge collection of microfilms of old manuscripts, printed editions, etc. And they had all of the Bach materials there, all of Bach's manuscripts, etc. I remember rolling through a reel of Bach parts to cantatas, that is, the original parts from which his musicians perform. So not his scores, but, you know, violin one, tenor, you know, cont organ continuo, etc. And I'm reading through this, and I come to one cantata, I can even remember that, it's Die Himmel Erzähl in die Ehre Gottes, it's BWV 76, and I'm starting to look through it, and I come to the vocal parts, and I see exactly something that I had seen with Schutz, exactly the same thing. And I said, if this is true, if this is true, then it's different with Bach, and that the whole thing is different. And at that point, though, I knew that I had to look systematically at all of the parts, which I did over the next two years. It was, Wait. So, for people who are following you, what yes. is the the what is the mainstream way of performing a Bach cantata? Well, the mainstream way um, has been since the revival of Bach's music to have what we call a choir, a chorus, which basically is defined by having multiple singers on each line of the music. Mm. Um, now, when Felix Mendelssohn, in effect, created this when he created the Matthew St. Matthew Passion in 1829, because really Mendelssohn created the Matthew Passion. Mm. Bach, didn't. Bach just wrote it and performed it in the seven, you know, in the 18th century. But nobody knew the piece uh, until Mendelssohn makes the present and he performs it, as of course you would in those days with uh, with over 150 singers. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and they didn't think twice about that then. And they needn't have done so. Um, by the way, I have enormous regard for them. That's not the point. And I'm not trying to say that they were dumb. No, quite the contrary. I mean, Mendelssohn is one of the greatest composers, musicians mm. ever to walk down the pike. These are wonderful people. But they set an agenda. Okay. So then in the 20th century, everybody becomes enlightened. And they start to reduce the choir. And by the 1930s, it was still, it was pretty much accepted that Bach's choir and performance was 12 singers, three sopranos, three altos, three tenors, three basses. Okay. Um, and actually, nobody really did this in practice. Uh, in practice, let's say people had a chamber choir, which would usually be maybe 30 singers, something like that. And that was considered oh. the proper, a good proper way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so here, here I come along. And, you know, I say, well, well four of, people. Or <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, uh, we're, we're reducing the choir, but this is ridiculous. But you see, the thing that became clear that, let's say, after I had gone through all of the parts multiple times, everyone, and really just to see anything that could show the contrary, it was clear that every time you could determine how many singers used a Bach part? The answer was one. There was simply no exception to this. That's point one. Secondly, we have surviving, we have most of Bach's parts still, by the way, and almost without exception, you have one copy of each voice, one soprano part, one alto part, one tenor part, one bass part. And finally, the evidence is overwhelming that there were not more. So, if you have one copy of each voice part, or oh, if you had already with Bach, one copy of each voice part, and one singer reading from that music, do the math. It's obvious. It's simple. What, uh, were, the, uh, what were the common objections that you received to this? Good question. Gets very slightly ahead of the game, and I'll come to that. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, Well, okay, I'll put it this way. It looked black and white. And I'm going to jump ahead in one way and say this. Nobody who has gone to the sources 
these manuscripts and study them with an eye to this problem has ever come back saying anything different. It's important to say this. So what did happen? Okay. The standard picture of Bach's chorus um, was actually created in the 1930s, not earlier. And it was created by a German scholar um, on this basis. There is a famous document. It's, a, it's what may be the most famous of all Bach documents. It's called in German the Entwurf einer wohlbestalten Kirchenmusik. English translation usually reads draft for a well-appointed church music. It's a memo that he writes to the town council of Leipzig in 1730. And in it, he says at one point, uh, he, he lists choir sizes. And he does speak of 12 singers at one point. There are some more complications, but he speaks of, let's say, a group of singers that is three sopranos, three altos, three tenors, three basses. And <coughs> this was accepted as the Bach choir. And so in the 1930s, a great Bach scholar by the name of Arnold Schering, uh, who knew the parts and knew their importance, said the following. He said, well, you have one copy of each part. He knew this already. He said, but there are 12 singers. And then he said something very significant. He says, there couldn't be more than 12 singers because only three singers can read from the same music. Now, mm -hmm. in retrospect, one can notice all of the unsubstantiated assumptions there. How do we know that three singers read from the same music? There's no evidence of this. There's no evidence of this ever happening, certainly in the 17th and really in the 18th centuries. Um, if you look at when he says more than cannot, it is clear that to him, a chorus is like a helium balloon. It grows until, you know, <laughs> it grows bigger or goes higher until something clamps it down, you see, until it runs into some obstacle. So, and, but this is a conceptual issue that is not easy. And let me be very honest, I didn't understand this all at first either. I could see the facts, I could see the numbers, but putting it all together and making sense of it all was a different matter. Um, we, but isn't I, there, um, and as a layman, let me, yeah. do, is, is there any document that says Box Church has employs 20 people, these are the singers, and so there's um, no document like that. There is no document like that, but since you raise it, there is another danger with documents like that. <clears throat> Let's say that there is a document that says, and we actually have something like that in the Weimar period of Bach, that says, okay, there are, there are 20 singers employed by the church. Let's say that we're not talking choirs, but we're talking baseball teams or American football. American football team has 45 players. Now, we all know that 45 players do not take the field all at once. A right. European football team, a soccer team, has maybe four goalkeepers on its books. They do not all go onto the field at once. So the question is, what do these numbers mean? And again, unconsciously, people tend to see a number like that and think, oh, that's, that's how many perform all the time. By the way, the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra has about 150 members. They never play at once. It's, it's, it's a pool from which people are drawn. Now, so uh, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Joshua. Yeah, I just, yeah. uh, just um, so yeah. uh, I think it was mentioned that. But look at these paintings of people looking at the same sheet. So therefore, it has to be three or two people. Yeah. Three. Well, um, my dear friend and colleague Andrew Parrott has pointed out that pictorial evidence has a way of dematerializing. These paintings don't really, I mean, one could go through all of them, but let me say this, that you see all of these points really are missing the point. The first thing to do is go to look at the parts. I mean, I could perfectly well be wrong. I could perfectly well be wrong in saying these are A, the strongest evidence that we have, and B, this is what the evidence shows. Fine. 
What's interesting is that nobody has done that. Nobody has gone to look at that. And those that have gone to look have all come out saying, oh, but it's exactly what you say there. You know, uh, I could name names, but uh, that's, that's, that's not the point. The question then is, okay, uh, what is the response? What are the arguments? Well, the response was basically, well, what about? Now, of course, uh, and even the point you raise about the pictures, well, yeah, what aboutism is unknown. <laughs> what about is but it's something we have to deal with. There's no question. And of course, I had to consider all of that. And I can mm. just tell you that the document with the 12 singers, etc., isn't saying anything of the sort. Bach is talking about singers needed to um, cover the liturgical demands throughout an entire year. You get one clue about this, for example, that where he mentions uh, really 12 singers, he says, um, you have to have 12 singers. And he says, and there, by the way, there, there are a number of choirs in Leipzig. It's not just one group. There are a bunch of boys at the Thomas Schule. And by the way, boys includes young men of 20, 21, 22. It's not mm. just, you know, boys as we would think of it now. But uh, there were 55 of them in Bach's day, and they have to provide music at four different churches. Mm. And not all of them are even capable of singing well. So you can see that there are certain numerical limitations there. Um, but, 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 but the point is that, um, sorry, no, I, I, I lost a bit of the thread there, forgive me. Um, they, are, they are the ones who will sing. And so uh, one has, to, oh, oh yes, uh, sorry. What Bach says was this. He said, in the choirs that sing more than simple chorales, not necessarily cantatas, you have to have at least 12 singers. But then he said, but why? He says, well, because, so if one of them gets sick, which often happens at this time of year, you can at least do a double choir motet. That is eight voices, and how many singers on each voice? One. In other words, he's talking about the mm. total forces you need to carry the out. Full the, football team. <laughs> the full football team. As I say, yeah. it's the squad, not the lineup. Right. It's, so these documents say nothing about the lineup. If you want to know what the lineup is, you have to go to the parts. These are what the people sang from. And as I say, the parts leave really no possible doubt. Um, or if there is a possible doubt, I'm the first who's been waiting to see it. Mm. Now, I can tell you, and I know this may not sound plausible, you know, one would have to do quite a bit of digging through a quite extensive literature to verify this. But you will find that all of those who attack this never say anything about the parts. They simply say, well, Bach said 12 singers, that's the end of the story. Now, I even wrote a little book on this business of this document, because you have to. So, and I said there, well, look, let's try to read this carefully. Uh, for one thing, I have to say, Bach's language is not modern German. Um, I'm fortunate that through the work I did on Schutz and other things, I'm pretty adept at 17th and 18th century German. Mm. And even, you know, German scholars say to me straight out, yeah, this is not stuff that people understand now. <laughs> um, and so if you read what he writes carefully, all I can say is that it doesn't say what people say it says. And again, uh, I've set forth arguments there, and it's perfectly legitimate for anybody to come forth and say, well, you know, you've misread this, and here is why the traditional understanding of this document um, is really the preferable one. Mm -hmm. But again, interestingly, nobody has done that. Well, I had a question, which is, could he have written uh, mm -hmm. in mind a large for a large choir, and has he done that or does this apply to his, all his vocal music? Okay. Um, first of all, he never did it. He never wrote for, so far as we can tell, uh, more than, let's say, two choirs each of four voices, a uh, total of eight. And sometimes they sing, in certain pieces, they sing in unison. Mm. So that's, that's 
basically the maximum. Um, now, well, as for the other side of the question, what did he wish for? Well, I mean, it's obvious. Bach always wanted the modern piano. He always wanted the modern <laughs> orchestra with valve trumpets and valve horns. He always wanted steel strings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we know, you know, we know such things, and you laugh at this because you're familiar with it in these other places. Um, but no. How would no you have reacted to the 20th century recordings of, you know, 20 people in each part? Well, Possibly he loved it. He would have loved it. Possibly he would have hated it. We have no way of knowing. Mm. But I can cite a couple of things here. That that that, you know. First of all, I wouldn't do this as a performer. I mean, look, my job isn't. I am very curious now about how that would sound. It sounds yeah, very well, good. Well, oh come on! You have it all over the place. You have the Thomana Chord in Leipzig with you know a hundred people, uh, with old instruments. I mean, frankly, I'm very tolerant. I'm very pluralistic. But that is crap. I mean that is fake. This uh, that 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 you have the combination of the modern choir and instruments with which, you know, which never performed together, and people sell that as authentic, etc. No, you know that's the one that's the one place I'll draw the line. But um, in the scholarly sense, I'm not in the research sense. I'm not interested in what Bach wanted because, frankly, there isn't evidence on this. I mean, when there's evidence of what a composer wanted, obviously we take it seriously, but we have no explicit evidence of what Bach wanted. We only have evidence of what he did. Mm. Uh, as a performer, I follow this not out of piety, but because, frankly, I think the music sounds much better that way. I think yes, it, I'm interested am, in here. Can you recommend a, a recording that people could first go to to hear this done well? Well, you know, some of mine are really not so bad. Um, the, 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 quite a few recordings of mine. I don't think they're all wonderful, but some of them, yeah, you know, uh, I think Wachet auf ruft uns die Stimme, BWE 140, is, is really pretty good. Um, uh, the old B minor mass for not such still holds up, I find, fairly well. You know, you can get a sense of what it sounds like. But um, like it or not, you know, to me, as a performing musician, the music is much more beautiful. In fact, I can even recall uh, Zygiswald Kaukin, uh, who's one of the first European heavies to take this on board. <laughs> uh, thank you. When we first met in Leipzig, we were talking, to me, talking with each other. Uh, I, I, I can admire Zygiswald a great deal. You know, at one point he said, but you know, the real reason to do it is that it sounds so much more beautiful. And I'm totally in agreement yes. with him. Thank you. Um, That's the right attitude. It's, it's, <laughs> no, it's the right, well, it's the right attitude in performance. You know, the scholar, the, the, the research, the scholarship has to be solid. I mean, this is yes. not just you're doing what you like. Um, yep. But as a it just happens to be the same thing, though. <laughs> well, I, I think so. I, I like to think so. Um, but I can, in fact, show you a couple of things or mention a couple of things that. I think show that Bach, whatever he quote wanted unquote, uh, composed for this medium. Mm. Um, you take the opening chorus of the Saint Matthew Passion, where there is no question that there were eight singers performing this, plus a ninth singer doing the soprano and piano. Not a huge boys' choir, but one singer was was a boy. But um, that throughout the movement the singers of choir one and choir two are sort of calling back and forth to each other. Now, at a certain point near the end, the two choirs suddenly join in unison. Now, I can remember still conducting the first rehearsal of this movement in 1985, the first performance we did of the Matthew Passion, according to what the parts told us. And I'm conducting away in a rehearsal. And yeah, I know the score, and I've read the score, and I've seen that the voices come together there, but you know, okay, so Bach's making it easy for himself. He doesn't want to write in eight real parts there, he'll do it in four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So I'm conducting away, and I do the cue at that spot, and I almost fall down, just, you know, like hit by a thunderbolt when I hear that sound of the second choir joining the first. And this, this very different sonority of 
two singers singing the same music, two widely spaced singers. It was tremendously dramatic. And at that point, I, I was so struck by this. And of course, in thinking about it, I have to say, look, I think one has to accept that Bach planned this, that he meant this, that he meant this as a dramatic climax of this movement. And that if you perform that movement in the modern style with multiple voices, that effect just is lost. See, mm. I'd never noticed it because I'd grown up with traditional performances. So here I think you, I, I, ha, I do have, I can cite, and I can cite many more examples where I think if you perform it in a modern way, you're going to lose something very essential to the music that I think we have to believe that Bach intended and planned. So I, that, I, that, that, that I know is subject to discussion, to debate. It's something that's inferred from the musical texts themselves. But again, I would have to say those who are opposed to it will deal with it and start arguing the matter. After 40 years now, I don't expect anybody to argue it. And I certainly, in a way, have grown It sounds popular. so compelling. It sounds so compelling. No, no, I'm very pleased by that. But, you know, for all we know, it could be, well, as a matter of fact, a very, very prominent musician. Oh, I'm not going to protect the guilty. Gustav Leonhardt once said, Yes. He said, it sounds beautiful, but it is wrong. And I... <laughs> Yeah. It said it was wrong, and I can prove it. I go, now, I I was curious, and I, 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 some years later, I met Leonhardt, by the way, and I said to him, you know, I'm curious about this, because you said you can prove it. So um, obviously, I'm interested in anything that can prove me wrong, and do you have a, some evidence that that... And, 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 and honest to God, he said to me, oh, no, I don't have any different evidence. I just read it differently from you. Wow. Now, I'll have to say that is, forgive this word, unethical and fake. And I lost a lot of respect for Leonhardt in that and A huge, uh, really a huge respected figure in early music. Yeah. And, uh, well, but not, not so fast in every way. Leonhardt's a complicated character. I mean, he's, I respect him enormously as a musician. I, don't, I, I never cared for his music making particularly, but I always had great respect for it, and I still do. But, um, you know, those in Holland... He had to admit that it was beautiful. He had to admit that. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm pleased that he did admit that it, <laughs> it was beautiful. But as I say, um, this... this that somehow, you know, his opinion is the truth. Well, he traded on that a lot. Uh, Leonhardt traded on an authority that was... That famous quote that, that he is considered the Pope of harpsichordists or something like that. Yeah, well, you know, he played on that. I mean, he didn't create it, I'm sure. But in a way, he created it by adopting this particular uh, high ascetic attitude, etc., which was not totally the truth of his life, you know. Um, but again, okay, he's human. I'm not. I, I'm not here to knock Leonhardt, as I say, for whom I do have a great deal of respect. Um, right. It's just that you know, I, yeah, I would have. And I suppose if he, could also if he had provided some evidence, that would have been a good sort of discussion. I think if he had the evidence, I would have loved to have seen it, mm -hmm. or if he could even defend how he read it, but to say, I can prove it? No, that just doesn't go. I will say one thing about that, it occurs to me. Um, there is something about this issue that has a lot of people, let's say, perform <laughs> beneath their level. Um, ah. you know, it's, it's not worthy of a Leonhardt to, 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 to adopt a ploy like that. It's not worthy of certain other scholars, I know. Um, and it, but I'm going to, let me try to put a positive spin on it. I mean, have I suffered for this? Oh boy, yes. Uh, just a <laughs> very simple fact that I, that I lost a lot of work. I mean, Andrew Parrott has experienced the same thing. Uh, Sigisvold Kalkin has experienced the same thing, although he, he has done better in part because of where he was, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, none of us have had it easy who've, who've, who've made the switch, as it were. But um, people clearly have a very, very, very vested interest 
in maintaining what had been the status quo. But the vested interest comes, I think, from a genuine love of this music and identification with this music. You know, when, when there were very vociferous reactions against this, when I, when I, when I first had the temerity to uh, <laughs> you know, I said sometimes, look, it's, it, it, it's like being told that, that, that what, the flag is in tatters, apple pie will give you tomain poisoning, and I mean, you know, mom, the flag, and apple pie, the great things. It's beyond and, the pale, essentially. Yeah, people were offended by it. And as I say, look at it, it, does, it doesn't excuse it all, but it also has its roots in, I think, genuine passion for this music, mm. love of this music, and, and identification for this music, with this music. And if you are being told that what you had identified with, with was not true, you take that personally in many ways. So wait, okay, this is mind blowing. So what? So what? Before every is all vocal music like this? And when does it suddenly become a big chorus? That's a very good question. Also, okay, to oversimplify, all vocal music before the middle late eighteenth century is fundamentally one to a part. Fundamentally. Now, as I say, that's oversimplifying. But so oversimplifying the chorus as we understand it as a performing entity doesn't exist. Okay. Now, when does it change? Well, uh, you know, it's like Hemingway's going bankrupt very gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> uh, it's really the late 18th century that's the key here. Um, first of all, the amateur choir is born in Berlin at the Zing Academy, where you have people getting together to sing older music and larger numbers of people. Now, there had always been a possibility of amplifying your basic chorus of single voices. And it was done. In other words, uh, the way it was done that, uh, that let's say you had you know, a five-voice piece and five voices, let's say two sopranos and alto tenor bass, were were the choir. But you could, under certain circumstances, under certain circumstances, set up a second choir that would sing the same music. So it would be in unison with your first five voices. Unlike modern practice, these singers did not stand together with the first five. They were separately stationed. But that is an option that you can do. That's an overdub that you can do, okay? So um, it was mostly not done, and most of the time when it's done, it's something that the composer specified, although very often specified as an option, not as something obligatory. But you have that, okay, so you have the possibility. Maybe this is like, you know, uh, I know the second hand, like the two versions of Taylor Swift's albums, you know, there's the, right. there's the more naked version and there's the more produced version of certain Beatles songs have, you know. So this is, I think, maybe not a useless thing to keep in mind about that. Now, in the later 18th century, you start to get uh, as I say, the amateur choir, where you have multiple members, and there was this practice of, or this possible practice of doubling up, of adding more singers. And we know that in the Berlin Zing Academy, they did this. And they sometimes did it using Bach's own parts, but they copied out extra parts. And as, as one friend of mine, a great German musicologist named Ludwig Fincher, sadly also, no longer among us, said, you know, these people paid membership fees. They felt they had a right to sing. So this is a <laughs> communal experience. I mean, that's a very wonderful thing. It's something, you know, yes. that I respect a great deal. Um, but so they sing this. Then you do have larger things happening. For example, in London in 1784, there's a performance of Messiah at Westminster Abbey with about 400 singers. In Vienna, less, less known at the same time in the 70s, there are performances of excerpts from Handel oratorios with 
What did they excerpt? What they do? Basically, the choruses, the only thing in which anybody was interested. Um, the only thing in which anybody's interested today. You know, you suffer through the recits and the arias to get to the choruses. Um, the choruses were sung by about 40 singers. So you have this sort of growth um, of choral forces. Now, Bach is not in the picture here. But in the late 18th century, for example, he starts to come into picture. So a famous German uh, music esthetician, Johann Friedrich Reichart, writes, if I recall, you know, Bach composes choruses that are every bit as grand as Handel's. <laughs> well, the jig is almost up right there. Then the Zingakade becomes along, Mendelssohn comes along. Right. And uh, so again, I can, I can, point to uh, one other neat example, which is going to make you laugh, and that it would make you laugh is, in fact, symptomatic. And that's this. There is a cantata by uh, Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, Auferstehung und Himmelfahrt Jesu. So, um, you know, resurrection and ascension of, of Jesus. And um, he performed it with eight singers, by the way. The choruses have eight singers in all in his performances. But there's a great bass aria in it with trumpets and horns and drums, so a really big noise in the orchestra. And in 1836, I think it is, a German, great German scholar uh, named Karl von Winterfeld writes about this oratorio, this cantata. People thought it was an oratorio. It's not. It's it's T.P. Bach was very specific that it's Matata, but he writes about this aria. And he says, now, this is a great, great aria. He said, but if it's to have its intended effect, it can't be sung by only one bass. You have oh, to. Okay. I think he said something like a veritable phalanx of basses. Now, you see, we think that's silly now, right? We're more enlightened than that. We know that an aria is only one bass. Yeah. Well, but not so fast. See, yeah. we know that a chorus is you know, such and such a number of things. Well, maybe not. Incredible, incredible. Well, what can I say? I mean, I, I, I might have to change my whole listening library now. So, <laughs> just because of this. So, this is interesting. I mean, I, 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 and I, I thank you for that. At least to give this perspective that I think a lot of people will be certainly very intrigued by, and. Uh, Joshua, I, I want to leave on one very quick thing, Please. which is... And I'm and, sorry and, that my answers are not always so quick. No, no, this has been yeah. fantastic. And okay. um, I, I mentioned in passing at the beginning of the interview about a rise in traditionalism in terms of certain things in music. Right. And, and I'm really, uh, we have been exploring pedagogy particularly. Right. And have you ever ex heard about partimento or something to do with uh, this sort really a basso continuo figured bass yeah. thorough bass general bass well, and what do you make of it give just your reaction to it essentially well i do know partimento although i'm not expert in it and i've seen that on previous occasions you had some partimento experts on including uh, is it sanguinetti uh, yes Yes, whom I've met also and had a shared a wonderful lunch in in Belgium many years ago. Uh, admire him a great deal. Um, Departamento is fascinating stuff, um, and it, it 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 offers a lot of insights into a lot of things. In terms of continuo practice, that is actually playing from the figures. I'm not sure that it really has that many implications, uh, because it's really a matter of sort of creating a kind of polyphony uh, from the figures. And I know this all opens up a whole nother can of worms, but basically I'm of the view that in, let's say, 99% of the occasions, continuo is something that is felt but not heard. It's mm job is really to be behind the other instruments and just help knit them together. The minute, I'll say this slightly exaggerated, the minute in an ensemble performance you really notice the continuo, they're doing it wrong. And partimento is not really part of continuo practice. What they share is figures, of course, and working mm -hmm. from figures. 
But again, to come back to Partimento, I think it's a fascinating thing. I, 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 I like everything that I know about it. I may draw different inferences from it. Uh, from what others might, or I might not draw the inferences from it that some might draw. But that doesn't at all diminish, I think, the interest of it and the importance of it, because it does give us a lot of insight into the way people are conceptualizing music and conceptualizing music pedagogy. Well, the great Professor Joshua Rifkin, I mean, really, been, what a tremendous conversation. It's been such a, I could just sit here listening to you talk about anything, really. We we didn't get a chance to talk about Joscan and shoots really too much, but let's let's say that for another episode. And, yeah. and I just really thank you so much for coming on the show, sir. So let's let's come back on again in the future. And I hope you, I hope you had a good time as well. Well, I'm delighted to have be, uh, been here. I really am grateful to you for inviting me and um, for really posing very, very interesting and often challenging <laughs> questions. So I, too, look forward to more of the same when the appropriate moment arises. And in meanwhile, thank you very much for this. Thank you.